yeah, I constantly keep calming down, so thank you. Uh, I will be speaking about uh, activity that is being done by several companies, uh, particularly this is led by Union of IT, IT Enterprises of Armenia, uh, founded by Karen Vartanyan and being headed by him. Just the same day when I was departing from Armenia, we have finished a uh, plan session uh, in Alveran where we, were, where we were basically planning next four year development plan for Union of IT Enterprises, but really it was a development plan for developing IT industry in Armenia, which Union of IT Enter Enterprises undertook this mission. And uh, so I have, I will, what, what I will be speaking about will be greatly also influenced by the, by the discussions that we had with many companies who are members of, I, of the UIT and who are actually active members. They are not just paying membership fee and considered members, but they do come to the meetings and they do participate in discussions which are important not only for <coughs> their company needs, but for the industry in general. And sometimes this goes beyond IT sector interests only because it's, first of all, education is very uh, related with this and impacted mutually. IT sector impacts education system and vice versa. And nowadays the IT is being used everywhere from basically education to government with e-government applications and so on. Therefore, it's a cluster where, which is very close, single hub connections to almost all, all sectors in Armenia that are currently uh, being developed and use, using or are candidate to use IT in information technologies and uh, high-tech industry uh, fruits. So first of all, few, I, I will tell a bit about main, uh, I'm representing here a group of companies which is known in Armenia as Instigate. It's uh, basically an incubator which started as a training center and then eventually turned into, into a basically a set of companies which are launched by this training center and incubator. Some of them are design service companies doing projects with the USA and German companies doing part of their systems, implementing them. And some of them are product companies, which are in different phase of uh, development, investment, and uh, deployment. So first of all, about uh, who, who started Instigate. Uh, first of all, it was Eno Wayne, my friend, who, whom I met in Silicon Valley. From 2001 to 2006, I was living there and working in an electronic design automation company where Eno was uh, the chief technical officer. And together we have built a product which, which became the main product of Monterey Design, the company where we were working at. Unfortunately, it were, uh, when we became lead, leaders of this company, it was the uh, decline, during the decline period of company. Er practically everyone has left it. <laughs> there was only a team in Armenia, like 40 people, and few people in the US. Uh, therefore, Eno became a CTO and I became software director which was very quick for that period of time that I worked, like two years or so, three years. So we built this product, which then got patented and it attained the interest of big companies like Synapsis and Cadence. Eventually they acquired this company and we left. Uh, I worked for a year in Synapsis and then uh, I also left this company. Uh, but the, in what is interesting to mention here is that Synopsis acquired Monterey not necessarily for the project that we have developed, but it only helped it to remain alive for a while. They acquired it specifically for the talent in Armenia. This was known to everyone in this industry. A uh, few, like five years later, when Instigate was participating in a uh, trade show in, uh, in San Diego, we've been ap approached by a some other company, which has nothing to do with Synopsis or Monterey, they were also trying to actually acquire us at that time, so he knew some insider information. So he said that we learned that Synopsis acquired Monterey for its Armenian team. Basically it was known to even outsiders that the, the real reason of acquisition was the, the talent in Armenia, and not really the product that Eno has defined and our team has built. So they, when they came to review the company before they acquired, they looked at the documentation, at the specifications, and they specifically appreciated the quality of specifications and documentation and quality of work done in production system, not 
basically they were they seen this team of ability to produce great great products and uh, it was basically an asset sale but turned down to be a good advertisement for Ar Armenia currently Synopsis has about 600 uh, employees in Armenia because after Monterey and, and Leda it was the same time it acquired two companies it acquired four other three three or four other companies and now it's a, it, it has a probably biggest subsidiary outside of USA it, uh, it's bigger than chi their China, uh, China subsidiary or Indian subsidiary and it became like a like a visit card like an advertisement for Armenia since then instigate whenever we were going in Silicon Valley First, in the, in the past, they were asking where is Armenia, and now they oh, that's the place where Synopsis is. So, or if they don't know, we tell them that Synopsis has 600 people, and that already makes it. We don't have to explain why they should work with us. So it was a, a great help for, uh, and for development of Instigate and design services. Um, so after leaving Synopsis, uh, we we basically incorporated Instigate. Eno proposed me. He, he liked so much working with the Armenian team. He proposed me to start our own company in Armenia. And uh, I called my brother, Ar Arman, and he got his friend, like 10 people. And I started teaching them over internet. For about one year or so, they were learning in balcony, in our balcony, sitting there. Mm -hmm. And uh, like they were typing a question about some programming language or a compiled process and so on. I was first fixing their English in the question and then answering their question. So it took about nine months. Uh, eventually this program of teaching from scratch uh, of very beginners, uh, it turned into a basis of Instigate Training Center, which then became the main facility for growing Instigate. And today, all these, um, all these cities where they either Instigate has a subsidiary or a training center, they are using that program to or uh, uh, basically it's, it was eight years ago, so the program has developed since, since then. But the basis was that. It, it was starting from very beginning, explaining the computer architecture, going into software and hardware design, because we were from electronic design automation space, so we needed to teach both software and hardware to be able to work in this area. Uh, so eventually it developed into a distributed training center uh, which currently operates in um, 10 cities of um, Armenia and neighboring. And, and uh, in Javak, we have a two training centers in Akhil Kalaki and in Bagdanovka, Ninos Minde. Um, the rest is in, in, in the current Armenian territory. Um, we started in Yerevan in 2005. The company was incorporated uh, when there were only 10 graduates of training center and we decided to do our own product. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to do fundraising by then in 2004-2005 period while the students were still learning. We didn't complete our fundraising and the product which we wanted to build, which we eventually did build, it's a, it's a design automation tool. Uh, we couldn't start it back then and the team was ready to work. So we decided that to not lose them, we have to do consulting. and. That basically made it impossible from then on to build our product because we got into consulting business and couldn't get out of it. However, the, we had a training center. And in training center, children, were, when, the, when the students were coming to learn, they had to work on something. So we were dropping them tasks which could become eventually uh, this product. And with this investment, which is, was half training and half internship and half product development, it eventually came into life. And in four or four years or so, we have developed a, enough amount of uh, pr product that then attracted funding. And in 2008, it was venture funded by German investors, which, which was the reason why we had to headquarter it in München, not in Yerevan. Uh, we've, we tried to find funding in Armenia, but Armenian investors back then was, were not, first of all, there was no private investment and public uh, the, the government decided not to go into such risk. We needed more than a million for very risky projects, so they couldn't do it. And the bug, at that time, Instigate was in a bad shape from revenue point of view, and we had to either lay off this team, which was by then very mature, like for three years they were working on very advanced software, 
And we didn't put them on customer projects. We put this on them on this project, and we ran negative and had to lay off this team. At that point, we did what probably a normal company in a normal country should do. We applied to government and said, "Look, <laughs> you are back then the." Actually, the main reason why Instigate went negative in 2007 was the dropping, artificial dropping of the dollar rate com uh, compared to Armenian drums. Since Armenia is an importer country, it's, it's primarily importer, and the majority of population are doing their business by importing stuff and selling to the people, which means basically the country is becoming less and less I mean, poorer and poorer, because the money flows out, the garbage comes in, gets consumed, and uh, eventually it gets bankrupt, right? And it starts selling its land for whatever, mining, for resources, and starts selling its people, right? People come to Silicon Valley, work, and they send the salary to their parents. So, <laughs> um, that, to, to stop that, you need to recover the import-export balance in the ca country. And uh, we were one of the exporter companies with revenue of about 1.5 million per year back then. And we were cash flow negative because in 2006, when I returned to Armenia, the dollar AMD ratio was 4, 450 drums per dollar. And in 2007, when we had this crisis, it was only 300 drums. So we lost 30% of our revenue, not because of bad business or bad economy. We lost it because the government artificially was keeping the IMD, the dollar rate IMD was appreciated artificially higher, which was good for people who keep shops and import stuff. And that was the majority of electorate. So government was doing what a democratic government should do. But it was bad for exporters. So we told them this, this doesn't work. We have to shut down these operations and so on. And we are pure exporter bringing in more than one and a half million. So it's a miserable amount for the country, but nevertheless, I mean, there is no export practically. So we wrote an email. We, we wrote a mail, put it in a letter and handed it off to government. In a very close, so we didn't go and find the friends or mafia or anything. We just did it through the official interface. And, and it turns out that when you apply with the official interface, the answer can only come with official interface. It has to be civil, civilized, educated application, and you get civil and educated answer. No miracles. Uh, in fact, from the day one, when Instigate was only 10 people, we became member of Union of IT Enterprises. And they were surprised because it was like Synopsys, Vivacell, or, uh, and so on, big companies. And then some 10 guys come in and say, we want to be a member. So they were surprised. But then they appreciated them because we wanted to be part of community, build networking, build community. And, and UIT, Union of IT Enterprises, is not only, or, or it, it's basically the main interface between the industry and government, as well as it, it has many other, uh, of course, missions, but this is the, one of the main tasks that it does. So we handed over this letter to Karen Vartanyan and asked him to hand it over to Minister of Economy. Uh, and Minister of Economy had to answer properly or send it to proper subsidiary of their organization. So it landed in the inbox of uh, small and medium development, uh, small and medium enterprise development center. And they had to look at it. Back then, this, this enterprise development center was funding with grants, like $10,000 grants, $20,000 grants, some small startups, like producing uh, juices and so on. And we asked for about $150,000 in order to pass this period of decline. And also, at the same time, force government to release the currency ratio so that we can continue operating. And they were surprised because they never had a request to get 150K. But we said, we don't want a grant. We want a bridge loan. We can turn this into a percentage of our company. Do You can become a shareholder of Instigate. And just give it as a loan. Don't give it as, don't grant it. Um, and they had to review this. We get, did a presentation. They first time see some PowerPoint slide and so on. Because usually people come and ask for money from them. And Minister of, Minister of Economy was also there. And he said, look, how many times did you get such a 
proposal, right? We, we have a chance to become a venture fund because we are just giving, handing out grants, but now someone is asking us to participate in their enterprise. And this was first time, basically, that this wall of distrust between the industry and government broke, and we basically start, uh, engaged in this deal. Uh, another interesting thing happened at, at that time. They asked Grant Thornton Amio, uh, it's a consulting company, it's a financial consulting company, they asked them to evaluate Instigate to decide how many percents of Instigate they should get against this $150,000. And usually, and it was interesting to see that many people, they knew how to evaluate company by just numbering the chairs, tables, computers, and seeing for how much they can sell it, right? But Instigate is an IT company. IT company is not evaluated like that. It's evaluated according to its intellectual property, its production capabilities, and so on. So this, it was interesting to see how they basically learned this and they had to change their evaluation schema. And instead of evaluating it as a, let's say, $500,000 company, they evaluated it something like, I don't know, they started with nine million and then they saw that Minister of Economy is not happy, so they lowered it down to two. <laughs> and then they came, started uh, bargaining. Eventually we said, okay, it doesn't matter what you want. If you want 50%, we'll give you 50%. But Actually, they uh, agreed on 16% or 18%, I don't remember now. But we said, we, we, we need a bridge loan. We don't want you to take advantage of our bad situation. We need a bridge loan so that we can buy back our shares if our situation recovers. They agreed, so we gave them shares, got this money. And then we found, got funding for Proximus, and we spun it off. We sold the IP. So Instigate has sold its IP to Proximus and got money. And purchase it back its shares. So basically it was the first time that government helped some IT company in Armenia to survive. And this instrument has become their standard instrument. SME DNC, this development center, has also applied it to other IT companies. And there was, it was like three times bigger for Sorcio they applied. They gave $450,000 to Sorcio. And Sorcio also successfully returned their debt and bought back their shares. So since then, basically, when we bought back our shares, basically they got 10% extra. And it was a big success story for, uh, for this organization. And the Minister of Economy was telling on the news, wherever it was going, we, we basically exit, exited Instigate with 10% profit. We are almost a venture company now, and so on. And they also started opening a techno technological parks, specifically in Gyumri, because Instigate had a subsidiary in Gyumri back then, and they used this as a, as a lobbying tool to convince government to invest in Gyumri and open a techno park there. Later, when we opened a subsidiary in Vanadar, they convinced the government to also open it in Vanadar. Now there is another one in Stepanakert and hopefully in, Gyum in Goris too. So we're instigating development in the regions. Also, from government's part, they are opening techno parks there, once the ground is set up. Uh, that's, um, that was a story about how Proximus started. Since then it became a separate company, which is headquartered in München, and uh, developed, the product is developed in Armenia. Uh, sorry, I, I think I have internet problem here. Anyway, let's see if I have internet. So it is. A, it has a user in a, uh, one of the major semiconductor companies, European uh, largest semiconductor company called ST Microelectronics, is now using it. It was another success story, which turned into a big advertisement for IT sector as well, not just um, not just Instigate. The, then, since then, we opened a few other startups. I'm not going to go into details about each of them. Uh, we have one startup in Silicon Valley, which, which we, where we participate as co-investors. Uh, it's not started by us, as opposed to many others, where the idea comes from us, the team comes from us, and investment is coming from us. Here is only investment, and it's a classical incubation. The idea came from other people who are doing business development. It's a, mix of robotics, electronics, and software. It's a garage door opener connected to internet with iPad, so you can issue temporary keys when someone comes to clean your house and so on. But the logistics around it, we didn't invent this. 
some people that have done it in Silicon Valley and asked us to go invest in it and we just put the team to implement it all. Electronics, software, uh, backend, website and so on. Another, uh, another product company which was had a very interesting but short life was Exergy, which started it with the same investors in Germany as Proximus. It was a supercomputing uh, hardware manufacturer. We had a partner in Germany who is building professional servers, but these are not standard servers. These are heterogeneous. They have contain standard CPUs and graphical cards which can be used for programming GPUs. And they, each of these has about 500, uh, actually 1,500 uh, processors inside, small smaller than the main main board but nevertheless like 1 gigahertz or 800 megahertz so you can run weather simulation oil oil research let's say seismic research algorithms and so on so one computer like this would be able to substitute a stack of 10 classical or more in fact up to 100 classical servers depending on how, which algorithms you're running on it and since it was not a classical computer, it was something exotic, and Proximus was specifically made to program some heterogeneous hardware, it became the operating system for it. And it was possible to run not only uh, Monte Carlo algorithms on it, but also video processing and so on. So we've done a project with a German company which was building surveillance solution with massive amount of face detection, massive amount of video streams coming from cameras in the airport into the security room, and phase localization algorithms and phase, and auto, it was all running in a single water-cooled computer, substituting their server room with 40 computers, like 48 computers, were replaced by single Exergy box, and Proximus was running as operating system. So this was very high-end development, a lot of parallel computing and so on. And it, all these nine monitors were also connected to that same computer and it was sitting under their table making no noise, generating no heat because the heating system was outside, it was water cooled and no, no, there was practically no noise and there was no need for server room as well. Another, another startup which is just in the process of being funded, this one has been supported by government of, actually it was supported by private funds like Granatus the, with the Enterprise Incubation Foundation, uh, they launched a grant program, and this is, was one of the projects which won grant. It's a video coding technology for 8K resolution videos, which is becoming to be a sta stand up after HD. There is a 4K, and then there is 8K coming. So we're developing technology towards that, and it's one of new developments. It's still not a separate company, it's a design team inside Instigate Training Center. What, uh, so, as, as I mentioned, we started in electronics and in uh, hardcore programming, like close to hardware programming and so on. Uh, and we were getting other projects from, from outside, basically. Our customers were in Europe and USA, and they were sending our way not only like embedded software development, but also mobile software development projects and website development projects, which we were turning down because this is not our profession. We don't know how to build a website which requires only two weeks to do. We know how to do long-term two-year projects with electronic design and so on. We were turning it down, but in, in 2010, something changed and we decided to accept this project. So, we were, we, in 2010, we had only subsidiary in Yerevan and Gyumri. And by looking at these five years operations, we realized that for entire period, Gyumri team was cash flow positive and Yerevan was fluctuating. And that's particularly in 2007, we had to take loan from government to survive. While Gyumri was as alone as a separate subsidiary, was always running cash flow positive. In fact, it was quite profitable. So we realized that it's not just good for the environment or people that they can work in their hometown without coming to Yerevan, but it's also profitable. It's a sustainable model, and we should make this part of our operations and of our agenda, basically, our <laughs> mission. And uh, we tried to expand in other cities. 
However, there was a big problem. In Gyumri, there was an IT center which was teaching people electronic engineering. And in Yerevan, we had many universities where computer scientists or electronic engineering people were graduating and coming to us. So we were missing only one side of the profession and we were giving it a training center and hiring people. While in other cities, we had to teach both electronic engineering and computer science. And it was, and at the same time, people were much less educated there, right? So you have to do twice more teaching in twice more subjects. It's like if you do a, a accounting software, you need to teach both programming and accounting. It's impossible to do, to do accounting automation software by employing people who don't understand accounting, right? So you had to teach two professions. But the time for web design, for mobile phone programming, it is not required. You, you have, everyone knows how to use websites, everyone knows how to use uh, mobile phones. And therefore, building a team which does mobile programming is not requiring electronic engineering and so on. So we decided to go into mobile and web area in order to enable opening divisions in regions. Uh, and Basically, we asked all our business development agents in Europe and America to start accepting projects for web and mobile. We started learning ourselves because we didn't know how to do a two-week two project where someone asks a website. And at the same time, start, we approached Stepan Eichert and Vanadzor State Universities to give us a place where we could start training center because uh, we, need to, we don't want to do everything on, I mean, we cannot do everything on our expense. In fact, we, want, we went to Stepanakert, and Vanadzor was just done in parallel by the VP of Engineering of Instigate. It was his hometown, and he said, well, if this is our mission, then I'm going and doing it in Vanadzor. So while Instigate was busy doing this in Stepanakert, he went to Vanadzor and replicated everything that we did. We went to Stepanakert State University, we went to Vanadzor Polytechnical. We asked a room, so he took a room there. And practically at the same time, the two groups started, and they, in nine months or so, we taught them basically ground up, uh, installing operating system, using tools, working together in a team, communication, using collaboration tools. Eventually, they started, they, they were able to do projects. And we started accepting projects, sending their way, collecting them back in Yerevan, doing quality checks, sending to customer. Since we ourselves didn't know how to do web design and mobile, it took a while. It took about two years until we learned this and didn't frustrate our customers anymore. And we spun out this company, which is focused basically on mobile and web programming. Since then, it's done quite uh, impressive, actually, projects. First is a German tablet, which was trying to get into market before iPad. They were <coughs> basically building a ground up operating system from scratch before iPad even came to market. Unfortunately, they started very late and they used Intel processors with fans and it was just didn't fly. But, but it was an interesting project. So Instigate has developed an operating system for it, starting from drivers, like multi-touch was not working. And it was at an interesting concept. It has the continuous long screen, where basically very interesting and very nice stuff, which unfortunately was immediately killed by iPad. As because it came into market like one month before and it had a big fun on it because it had the Intel CPU. Anyway, this product is still probably is being sold in Germany and it's done by developers in Yerevan and, yeah, and also Gimri actually. So another project, there are, I'm not going to go into details, but there is one more interesting one which you can buy on, on eBay, I, on, no, on Amazon you can buy mouse which is also a scanner by LG. So technology of it is developed by a Swiss company, which is our customer. So they are building the technology and, and basically giving it to LG and LG is selling under their brand. It's a substitute for a scanning device. It's a small mouse-like device, which you can use as a mouse. But then you press a button and it starts scanning the page basically into the computer. So. It has a camera inside, it's roboscope, and it does all the reading, and robotic algorithms are running there to figure out where it has already been and where it, Basgen knows this. So, and we port this into other operating systems. We enable it on Macintosh, Windows, and now are porting it to mobile devices. So development is done in Vanadzor, and QA is done in Stepanakert. So that's about Instigate Mobile. 
this, uh, this encouraged other companies to go to Stepanakert uh, and Gumri. Currently, even Synopsis has officially declared that, which is being a USA company, it's a big decision to make because Stepanakert is a land which is disputed, but Synopsis uh, management has decided nevertheless to openly uh, declare that it is starting training center there. So, while many Armenians are still considering Artsakh as separate land and not painting a map like this, but differently, everyone decides himself which lands should be given back to Turks. So everyone draws this the way they think is correct, but Synopsis decided to open a training center there. So, um, I so there are a few other things. I, I will only mention Instigate Robotics, which is our latest uh, company, or subs it's actually fully owned a subsidiary, separate company, which is which was born out of our activities in schools. Uh, we started working with education, actually since very beginning, uh, each of us was teaching, like I am now teaching in American University of Armenia, was teaching in Yerevan State University and Yerevan State Engineering. Also, I'm now teaching in Slavonic University, Russian Armenian, and many other people in Instigate were teaching. But our involvement with the education system was not limited with this. Uh, apart from our training centers, we were also contacting local schools and helping them to transition their education system to more modern stuff, and also to GNU Linux, which is the main tool which we use in production even to build things like uh, this presentation and so on, it's all running on GNU Linux and uh, many of our customers are using that and big companies in Armenia like Synopsis, Mentor Graphics, all of them are using that but the, but the institutions are still using Microsoft Windows to teach and this is a big problem. Every company has to open their, their training center to re-educate students before they hire them. So instead of spending these resources on training center, we want to improve schools and stop having own training centers. So one of the tools to teach children is actually robotics, robotics kits and so on. And that's, that's what we were doing since the last few years and Instigate Robotics has started trying to monetize on this because when we do these projects and help schools to install robotic kits, it it's uh, both, it cannot run just out of our goodwill, right? If something happens to instigate, this is over, right? It should be self-funded, uh, sustainable model, otherwise, because the ch challenge is big, it's bigger than instigate, and therefore the model should be sustainable and self-funded. So we're trying to find a way to productize this and ideally even export it to other countries because it's a tool to improve IT education system in the country. So we can approach Kazakhstan, we can approach I don't know, Dubai, other, go other cities, countries, governments who want to invest in their IT sector. And this is a product which at governmental level can be acquired and installed in the country, in all schools, in a systematic way. It is accompanied by a by a website which co coordinates all those schools. So this is the one which we are building for Armenian, for Armenian Ministry of Edu basically Armenian Education System. It, uh, it basically has a map where all the schools are, have access to their resources. They can upload their training materials. They can share it with other schools. So currently about 44 schools outside Yerevan and more than a dozen inside Yerevan are being run uh, with this program. Uh, I will now show a few videos which explain what is it. So each region has few schools select, already selected. The uh, program is starting, uh, has started there since last six months or so. And for each school there is a wiki page where they can, it's, it's going to take a while until the wiki loads, so they can run their materials, they can put their lectures here, the teachers, and um, there is a forum page and so on. So we are slowly turning that, this into a more usable and touchscreen friendly interface, but currently there are a few older technologies used on this platform. It's still under development. 
Uh, but the programs are running in the school. This portal, which combines all of that and also has associated video classes, there is all, this is the old version of the portal, which we started to, uh, to enable access to the resources like uh, teaching videos, uh, so that we don't have to bring uh, teachers from regions into Yerevan for training, but they can just look at the videos and show it even to children, not necessarily uh, even learn it. <laughs> Sometimes teachers know less than their students, but still children do a good job. So there are lessons which explain one after the other with screencast how to program with these tools that we created for children. First tool is called Tahves. It's an adoption of MIT Scratch. It's a programming tool for children, which is created by MIT University uh, by Media Lab. It's an open source product, which also has the ability to connect to robots and drive robots. So children can program this. So this is almost, this is the first lesson. So basically, it's lesson by lesson. It goes with introduction, and then uh, even in the remote villages where the teachers don't know English, don't know Russian, they cannot look at the English versions of this. We're building the Armenian versions, both with user interface turned into Armenian, the teaching, and uh, also we added some drivers to run motors so that the same tool can be used to program robots. And robots are, uh, so robots, I don't have a picture of it yet, actually. second, I think here we have an example. <coughs> Okay, so here is the these are games that uh, children can write with with this application. I, I will just show a few examples. And this is the robot, uh, which is to program this robot. Uh, unfortunately, video doesn't play well. The this is the program which children write and then using the remote control they can control this robot and it's all written in this environment. So it's, it can be used both for programming these virtual objects which you can see on a screen as well as for, so children write games like this. It's quite a complex game in fact, if you think about it, it's very hard to write it but school children at the sixth grade are able to write such games. And uh, then they use the same tools to program. So there are some mathematical tools which help to re uh, refresh mathematics knowledge and at the same time teach programming because it's like a virtual robot which can, has a pen and can open, uh, can turn it up, down and rotate. And by <coughs> commanding this robot, you paint different things. And uh, this, and then children very quickly get engaged into this and introduces them not only into software development, but also to uh, program, robot, robotics. This is an uh, ambassador of the U of US ambassador who visited the school where we installed Nairi Lab, one of the first Nairi Labs. And they actually, USAID is also funding these programs. This is one of the first copters, which is an educational copter. It's built by Instigate Robotics. It's uh, done in cooperation with the Illinois University professor, Naira Hovakimian who has invented a stabilization system for uh, copters and she also created a company which sells these copters to the different universities worldwide. So the production of it is moved to Armenia and Instigate Robotics is doing it. And they are quite robust and capable so it can, can be used outside of education field as well and we are now discussing with um, partners, investors and potential customers applications of this in other areas, uh, like um, surveillance, uh, agricultural crops monitoring, uh, and so on. This is a 3D printing device, which, sorry, 
which is a do-it-yourself 3D printer that helps children to print pieces of the robots. Uh, so you can see it from close up. It basically melts down the plastic and layer by layer creates objects like this. Like this. Uh, it, it can print itself. So pieces of itself are printed by another copy of itself. And having one 3D printer, children can print out another one. And it's being controlled by open source software, which we plan to pass to universities and let the universities develop them. Like MIT has created Scratch. We want our universities to continue developing them and localizing to Armenia. So our projects are directed not only towards schools, but also universities. To schools, we give this as products. And to universities, we give the software which they can continue developing and giving, handing these projects out to their schools. And the same project basically is used as a tool for students. And then another device which is used for more uh, rigid structures like so CNC drilling machine is another product which is part of Nairi Lab. And with these two together, basically children can print out and design their robots the way that they can they imagine. Instead of using pre prefabricated stuff like this, which is the first model that was installed in those 44 schools. Uh, so this is a, this is a prefabricated robot and. One second, let me show. So now these metal pieces can be cut with CNC device and the plastic pieces can be built with 3D printer. And the, part, and the control system that runs in this robot is also currently not locally made, but we want to make, make a laboratory where the children can make the control system and computer as well. So this is one of the first attempts we did. It's the first computer built by our post-Soviet Armenia called Aigestan. In fact, the motherboard, unfortunately, is not Armenian. It's not done in Armenia yet. But the printer is a Raspberry Pi. It's a British development, China printed. Uh, but the case has been 3D printed in the laboratory. And children are designing their own cases. And operating system is also it's called Arax. It's a fork of gentle Linux done by Noraj Chilingarian. He has created Arax with the goal to localize it for countries of Arax River passing. <coughs> so it has, in, uh, it has uh, Iran, Persian translation, it has localization in Arabian, Turkish. So if the companies want to export their stuff into Iran or, or, or Middle East, they can use Arax as a base. So it's a, not only educational system, but also production system. And it's, it's an Armenian development, Armenian operating system running on computer, which is called Aigestan. Uh, Aigestan is the school, is the village in Askeran region of Artsakh, where our first project started three years ago, two and a half years ago. We started teaching Avves in their school and in their, for their village, after their village, we called Aigestan. And this, but it's a Raspberry Pi is a weak board, so we needed a stronger board. This is another board from Chinese manufacturer, Mars board. And there is <laughs> Armenian engineering team that can build such boards, and we're now in negotiations with them to build a little bit newer version of this so that children can see made in Armenia on the board mm -hmm. and know that if they choose this profession, they can work in their country, not living it. This is not only done outside of their country. And this one, this model is a little stronger, more powerful. It runs all the tools that I showed here. Arax operating system, Arves and Kriya, this turtle program. It's called Berzor. In Berzor we have two schools. There are about 10, 10 children in each studying. Quite, actually they can already program this robot. They already got this robot and are getting prepared for the competition. Some boards are already produced in Armenia. This is a robotic board with Arduino. Uh, it's made by Na, uh, Artin Varujan, CJSC, a company which is doing uh, design and manufacturing of, PC, of PCBs. It contains extens extens it's extensible boards. These are, these are to control motors. And these extensions are to put buttons or other sensors like LEDs and create a remote controls. So children are putting the computer together with this board into the robot and another computer together with this board as a remote control they are using to control their robot. Unfortunately, I didn't bring everything to show it. But then the version of this robot that you see here, which was controlled by a laptop, 
It was controlled from a laptop and it was made from pre prefabricated pieces. Now it runs fully made by the children in their lab and uh, it's controlled from the remote control that they make, basically. It's, it's a different level of, of teaching where children have no, basically they no problem understanding what is inside. If we just teach them Java programming and they program devices like this, they don't really, really, really un they are not sure if they can make such a device. Well, here they see it transparently. It, they see everything, how it's done and so this uh, Arves is specifically made so that it can be taught in middle school from sixth grade, like uh, 15 years to 17. And then in high schools they start doing uh, more high level, more serious programming with real robotic applications. Unfortunately for small children, it's, unfortunately for small children it's not interesting, so we have to make it with Arves. And now with this it is possible, and these 44 schools which got that robot are now, there is more children of age of 6th uh, and 7th grade than of high school age. And this is a problem about which I wanted to talk here too. Unfortunately, no matter how many dollars we spend there and how many, much effort we spend there, it will not help because there is a big problem in high schools in Armenia. People. First of all, in intermediate school, there is lack of knowledge about this profession. Children do not come to, strong children are not choosing this profession. They don't know about the opportunities that they have if they choose this. They don't know that 10,000 employees in this field are there in Yerevan and they need another 10,000, but they cannot find them. They are, all of them are hiring. And um, people in village don't know this. So if their child is a good student, they suggest them to go to some famous professions, right? There are many. There are doctors, there are law, law schools, and so on. So it's, if the family doesn't have traditions in engineering the, and they don't know what's going on in Armenia, they do not advise their strong children to choose this profession. Second bigger problem is that if you go to high school, there's no one there. There's no strong student there. Everyone is with some private teacher. Mm -hmm. They're not even coming to school. Those who have to go to university, whose parents have decided that they will go to university, mm -hmm. man it's mandatory for them. After hours, after school hours, they go with private <coughs> tutors, and private tutors are teaching them how to pass the exams in, like something like alternative, of, uh, like SAT here, basically. It's become such a big uh, problem that it's practically impossible to pass this exam until, unless you do like three, four hours preparations <coughs> per day. So after the school, children go to these preparations. And this is an after school class. It cannot be done in, during school hours, which is only one, one hour per week or so for informatics, right? It has to be done after hours. But strong students in the high schools after hours are busy. They are not going to sports, they are not going to music, they are not going to painting. All of them go to study English, mathematics, physics, but not really study English. You study English when you work with the teacher, right? And, and she or he teaches you English. What they do, they are learning specific way of passing this exam with some special <coughs> test. This is not English. If they pass this test, get the highest mark, you try to speak to them English, they cannot. They cannot. And they, they don't know English. In fact. They just know how to pass this test. And that's what the, most of their time is spent in high schools. So while doing this and trying to find these 50 schools where at least some motivation exists among parents, <coughs> among teachers, among directors, and so on, we found only 60 schools. We could, find, we could get funding from government and private sector for 100 schools, but we chose only 60 because in the rest it, it made no sense. And that's the reason why we have a high success rate because Almost all 60 schools are still there and they're still teaching these robotics because it's, it took a year until we visited each school and chose the one that has basically motivation inside. Either both among students, their parents, and even the teacher doesn't want to learn yet another new thing and introduce new subject. I mean, they, everyone wants status quo is their religion, basically. And <coughs> 
And we're now trying to fix both problems. In the, mediate, in the intermediate school, we're trying to explain that this profession is, first of all, interesting. It's challenging. So these are the tools to explain it. You don't have to explain it. You just give it to children, and they just don't get, they just don't get out of this class after that. Are you doing this explaining, as you say, bottoms up or top down? Pardon me? So you say you want to fix them to do this. Are you doing it from the top down? Maybe from the it's always... It's or are you doing it from the bottom up? Individual teachers doing this? It's always, it's impossible to do something bottom up or top down. You have to do both. You have to go from Minister of Education, convince him, get permissions, get funding. But if he gets, even if you convince him to send order to everyone, no one will do it. They will sabotage it in every way they can because they don't want to move. So you cannot do it just top down. Neither you can do bottom up because no one wants to even listen to you if you didn't get permission from Minister of Education. So we choose the schools which listen to us, even though Minister of Education. So some of them were not, didn't even want to talk to us. And then when children see this, they just get excited. You don't have to explain them anything, many of them. We, we don't have very high marks. In fact, from one side, you can see, call it ambitious. From other side, it's not ambitious at all. We want about 5,000 engineers per year. to graduate. There are 1,000 schools. So if we get five children from each school, that's that means 5,000 children per year graduate to work in this profession. And that's already f much more than what Armenia is delivering now. It's not 5,000 per year, much less. So if we, so we just started last year. This year is going to be even more aggressive. We are now doing private and public fundraising for Nairi Lab, which is not just this robot with our vest, but it's entire kit, 3D printer, CNC device, lot of motors and sensors that children can build anything they want from it. A more advanced version of it is still in development with, co with copters and motor and propeller research kit, but that's for universities already. So we already got funded about, uh, I think we, this year we will launch about 15, 20 Nairi labs in those schools where already run this program. So in each regional center where Instigate has a subsidiary, we will install one which will be shared by neighboring schools. And some schools got private funding, like in Java, we just got five schools funded, so we have to install five Nairi labs in Java schools. It's the same for SUNY. How much does each uh, Nairi lab cost? To launch? Currently, due to CNC being too expensive and 3D printer, it's about three. Uh, I think it's about four thousand for all the hardware plus thousand overhead and our cost of traveling there and so on. But we believe it. If, we are now working with this company which manufactures 3D printers and CNC. It's all Armenian. It all says made in Armenia, designed in Armenia, manufactured. So we're talking to them and because we want children to see that it's made in Armenia. They, they, so that we don't explain them that this profession exists, right? So it's important for it to be made in Armenia. So, and bef because of that it's expensive. You cannot make it as, as cheap as in China, right? So. Uh, but anyway, they promised us that they can fit both of them under $700, which means that Nairi Lab can, uh, can cost about 3000 or so this year. We'll see. Um, yes, the cost of uh, the equipment for teaching. So it, it comes with these computers, which is about $100 after, tax, after taxing in Armenia. It's about $70, the motherboard. It contains Wi-Fi, it contains quad-core CPU, 2 gigabyte RAM, it runs RX, reported RX on it, RX and so on. So now we're switching from uh, uh, Eigestan and Berzor to these computers, which are called Gugar, after Java school. And this is a version of Gugar, which has been extended by our children. Of, they are ninth, ninth grade students. They came after studying all of this. I said, do you want to also do electronics? They said, yes. So I gave them a task, I, I gave them a task. So this computer has only one USB port and they were always attaching USB fork to connect it to the keyboard and mouse. So I said, let's make one which has four USB ports. So they took this contents of the USB fork and welded it with the, took off the USB and then 3D printed a new case for it. They designed and 3D printed it. And then I said, we want to connect it to the socket without power adapter. So they designed and printed the power socket. So now 
The new version of this, which I did not bring, now connects to 220 volt. And it has a Wi-Fi in it, and it can broadcast Wi-Fi in the house. But it needs internet connections, so there are dongles, right, with which you can connect to internet in Armenia, like Vivasel and Oran. Now they are taking out the contents of a dongle and welding it in. So the new device will give internet in-house, connect to the and be a set-top box. It can connect to the TV. Now next step, which I'm doing with them, and I would invite Alde, is, is fundraising for it. So they will build a startup, which will be doing IPTV, <coughs> Since there are many channels in Armenia which are not broadcasted via UCOM, like, uh, like A1 Plus and Lerat Vakan and so on, we want to build an alternative radio and video station. They will have to write a web backend where they, where they, where they put the video <coughs> streams, and then they stream it into these devices. And they, they should, I, I, I'm going to take them with me to negotiations with uh, Vivacell and Orange to basically integrate this as a solution and sell it to their sales channels and taking them to negotiate to fundraising pitching events so that they first have to invent a name for their company so now they're in the phase where <coughs> they're done with training or well not done they started training and at the same time they they now get training in entrepreneurship some in some way okay the, the last topic before we finish is you know about Artab, which they I will say a few words about this. The history of Ar the story of Artab, it's not history yet. Hopefully it will be a good one. And and what um, what we are doing with them. So the company is called Mino, it's based in um, Santa Barbara, created by uh, one of the co-founders is Vahan Shakaran. He is uh, he lives in Santa Barbara, and they, uh, thanks to him, they run operations in Armenia since, I don't know, a few years, in some, in some stealth mode. Uh, this company is building business-to-business -business solutions. They are building custom tablets for businesses. So they're not, you cannot buy this off the shelf, but if you are a big business, like a school system, like educational, Ministry of Education or some city uh, department, and you want, or, or let's say an organization like institute, university, and you want to equip all your employees with the device which has access to their website, to their website, to their client email, to their corporate resources, you can approach Mino and they can build custom solution for you. You can say what size, whether you want Wi-Fi, GSM, 3G, do you want a camera, how many, and so on. So that's what Mino is doing. It's a business-to-business -business tablet manufacturer. And it runs Android, and they do custom software on it for individual businesses. When they hand over, it already has all the software pre-installed, and software is done in Armenia. And the laptops are manufactured in China. They go to China, make sure that it's done according to their specs. They do the quality assurance, and then ship them over to USA. And the people who work on it, who do the quality control, they were flying from Yerevan, they were renting a hotel, spending their days and weeks until the whole uh, amount is there. They do quality check, return the uh, basically non-working ones, wait until the new ones come and then come back. With so Vahan has proposed his co-founders, instead of flying these people to China, ship the details, ship the parts to Yerevan and assemble them in Yerevan. And since the government has decided to start the economy free zone, which will help us to simplify the accounting when you ship, the, ship parts, assemble and ship out you don't have to pass through customs anymore um, therefore, for example, many production can be done in Armenia without passing Armenian border you just do, do it like outside Armenia um, they decided to do it so this year uh, they purchased space they applied for this free economy zone and Antap is their brand which is produced in Armenia they decided to add one more brand. Instead of Mino, it will be called Antap. So the ones that will be shipped to the USA will be called Mino for the US customers. In Middle East, in ex-Soviet territory, they will use another brand, Antap, for many reasons. For marketing reasons, for the reasons that Armenia needs to have their own brand and so on. And when we learned about this, uh, we were working with Ministry of Education on school computers. Actually, we were working against school computers. 
because Ministry of Education decided to buy computers for children of first grade, which is five years old. And my five-year-old daughter just went to school. And of course, I don't want her to play with this. So when they asked us to develop the program for children of the first grade, we first thing we said, no. You should not give this to children of first grade, and it should be at least sixth grade, like these programs. And you should spend the money, instead of spending 10 million on buying this per child, like 40,000 children, if you spend 250 on it, it's easily gets to 10 million. So you can spend about 6 million, and every one of the 1,300 schools of Armenia can have one Nairila, and it would be a huge, huge help to the industry. So we, we, we lost that battle. The government has decided to buy instead computers for children. So we're trying to convince them not, at least not to buy tablets, but to buy full screen computers with mouse so that they can do design, like graphic design, web design. Of course, for the first grade, nothing can be done. Anyway, two stupid decisions were made. To buy this instead of normal computers and to first grade instead of sixth grade. So we lost both battles and there is a saying, if you cannot fight something, become a leader of it. So we decided to become, become a leader of it. Uh, we said, okay, we will implement operating system for it, and we will put educational stuff on it. So we will decide. <laughs> of course, we cannot decide what to put there. And for first graders, nothing really can be put there, just a few movies. So whatever we put is, first of all, is this was done in a touchscreen friendly environment, where basically by it's a prototype, it works slow, it's the same thing as I used for doing demo. It's one of our startups about which I didn't talk, it's a special, I don't, I don't want to talk about it, but this technology is now being applied to build desktop environment for ARMTAP. So it will be different from other tablets, not only from the fact that it's assembled in Armenia, but it also has unique environment, which is totally, like HTC Sense, has a specific environment which is different from other Android phones, this one will have its own environment. And guess what? Mino management liked it so much that they asked it for Mino as well. We of course say that we do it for Antab only, so now they are preparing it. We are in negotiations with them. Maybe we'll do a commercial project for them. But for Antab we do it for basically gratis and uh, in return we get control on application store, on what goes into it. Ideally we beat out, if there is, we, whatever we do here is not charity. That's one important thing I want you to not be uh, confused about. All of these are super ambitious projects. Like if it's Nairi Lab sells for 5,000 in Armenia, but in Dubai we will sell it for 15,000. In Kazakhstan we will send it for 15,000. So it's, it can be a super profitable project. So none of, all of those have, have a business plan under it. Same for this. We know we are doing it for free for Anta. But we're getting App Store, which has 40,000 users. Of course, these are not payable users. They're first grade children, right? And you shouldn't give them this. So we'll make sure it doesn't work. But we get uh, 40,000 users in App Store. It's, it's not charity. But for education, first of all, we put there these robotics, these videos for teaching robotics. Of course, for first grade graders, this makes sense. But whatever, we already had them, so we added this robotics section, and we hope the first graders will never be forced to learn robotics or programming. But uh, another important thing is we are, uh, uh, actually good decision that government made this time, it is good, they decided to add dances, national dances program in the mandatory, like with chess. And like it, with chess, it, would, it wouldn't work had there be a person behind it, like uh, Sambat Lututian, who made it, because if someone just wakes up and decides that he wants to put chess into schools, it doesn't happen, even if you are a president, right? If someone needs to implement it, and chess came into schools relatively successfully thanks to Sambat Lututian, and not thanks to a decision. So same here, uh, it will not work unless we have people working on it, and Gagi Ginosan, our friend, and one of the people with whom we are doing stuff which is beyond IT, we're working with schools on other areas too. One of them was uh, Armenian Sijanunas Tilbusas uh, program, which is unfortunately not easily scalable. And second is Kagi Ginosian's uh, program for basically reviving village dances from different territories of Armenia, from Western Armenia, 
Iranian Armenians and so on. This is Karin's uh, dance from Karin region, Erzurum. It's uh, the, the so it's called it's called Karma Kochari, and this is the educational version of it, where it shows how to how to do the moves. And there is a kinetogram, which is a special writing system for dances, like notes for the music. There is a special system for dances. And if you want to introduce something into schools, it has to be science-based, right? You cannot teach music without teaching notation system. Same here. We are implementing interactive applications for <coughs> noting down the dances. And this system, this cybernetic system for no noting down the motion, has been invented by Sir Pui in 1940s. And with this system, she wrote down about, I think, 3,000 dances from different uh, regions of Armenia. Back then, people were still dancing it. And then now, they only do this helicopter <laughs> dances. But back then, they, were, they still remembered. And it is all in the books. Unfortunately, many, few people know these dances, but they are in these books. And Karin is reviving them and bringing back into the, to the, to the people. And these are not ballet or something. Hard stuff. It's just regular village dance. It's very nice, beautiful, a lot of soul and energy in it. And each dance has a history, where it was recorded, what was the meaning of it, what is the meaning of each steps, and so on. So this program is now being developed, and it will not be available only on Armtab, it will be also on the web. So any child, any child of any grade, no matter do they have Armtab or not, they will have this. Another important thing which unites people of all times, and I mean Armenians of all times and all territories is Grabar, the language of 5th century and beyond, right? And there are, there are organizations which are working on reviving Grabar knowledge and introducing this to school-aged children, so that, like Latin, for, for English, for Latin language speakers, like uh, Latin is important. Uh, basically, it's a language which People need to learn if they want to have connection to their roots, if, if they want to improve their speaking skills, be no, more noble in their speech, and so on. So this is a tool to achieve it, and there is a program, but our friends are doing it, and they allowed us to use their videos, but they need to adjust it for children, so we maybe we'll have to do a new one, but have no time to do fundraising or working on it, even, but it's in the plans. We are currently using their program, but eventually we'll add more. There is a, another important project, audiobooks, uh, for where the text and playback are synchronized, so you can press on a text and the playback will go there. We are using this technology to, uh, to implement some program which is controversial according to some people, but we don't think so. Um, I don't know if I can find it here. I will, I will, okay, I'll do it a little later when, when we talk. So it's a, the idea is that many regions of Armenia speak different dialects. And children, when they go from Askeran to Aparan, they cannot understand each other. And this creates problems. But, in fact, it could be the opposite. They could be happy about this, that they have such a diversity. They could love it. They could be proud, of it, but now they are just don't want. They don't like this. They they make fun of each other and so on, right? Therefore, when children come to Yerevan, they stop stop speaking their dialect. They speak Yerevan street dialect, which is not even Armenian, right? It's some garbage. So they pick up this and they lose the, all the strength of their type of their dialect and so on. Apart from Gyumri people, Gyumri people keep their dialect, and therefore they are also very different from everyone else. And we want each, each place to be proud of its dialect, and also like the others, appreciate the others, and maintain their own, and learn, but to appreciate you need to know, you need to learn to, to love it. So we have created this program. There is a, there is a 15, uh, there are 15 books, like 15 book series of tales of different regions, which are collected during about 20 years during Soviet time by academic, Academy of Sciences. 
So there are tales from Kapan, fairy tales from Goris, from Java. So from each of these, we are choosing few example tales and hiring uh, professional actors who do who native language, who speak native language, like from Kapan Theater. We're hiring a teacher. She's re he's reading it, and then we're putting it in synchronous player with the text. So children can read the text, can listen to the how it sounds, and then can, can see in the vocabulary what each word means, because there are many Turkish words used and so on, so they have to understand it. There are very interesting tales, which in the past, strangely, people were t telling to their children, but they are kind of X-rated, <laughs> most of them. So we chose the ones which are less shocking, <laughs> and made this turn into, into, the, into the fairy tales. And I mean, speaking books, basically, audio books, with corresponding text. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so this is what goes into our tab currently. There are some projects which are done for first graders, which should be thrown into garbage together with the untap because first graders should go to street, play, fight, and <laughs> dance, and song, sing, and not, not work with the tablets. But we, as I said, we lost that battle, so we're now leading the untap for first graders after losing it. <laughs> Yeah, as you see, most of the classes are for sixth graders anyways, as, as you see there. Second, we don't just hope, we are working on it. <laughs> so, everywhere where we talk, we tell this, even to them. Even when presenting this program, we are telling this, that this is wrong. And they promise it that next time they consider giving this to sixth graders. I see. I don't know. But they already spent ten million dollars. Uh, it's still in. It's still not signed. The contract is not signed. Another question I have is: Are you taking your projects from your factory, from your <coughs> schools, or you're using the schools, uh, student, and no. kids to create your product? Uh, we we the products are hosted on the internet. They are created by us. We hope that at some point we can transfer this to university. Yes, by us, by Instigate and other companies in the in the Nairi consortium. We are not alone. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me show that the. So members of uh, unfortunately internet is again not there. Something is wrong with the internet. But the, the, the members are, as I mentioned, first of all, Union of IT Enterprises. The Alex operating system is made by Nora Chiningaran. It's not our development. Alves is an MIT project, which we, did, we just localized and wrote drivers to control the motors. Otherwise, it's MIT as scratch. Kitartel is an open source development. We just translated it to Armenian. Translation was done by students, master's degree students of Gumriti. So we are connected with universities. They are sending their master teach students and we are giving them these assignments so that because the vision of Nairi consortium is to pass this all to universities. That's one of the reasons why we use only open source software. So that then these universities can continue improving it and they can use it as their master degree programs. And the children instead of doing some undetached project from life, they do it for their neighbor school basically. So these two students in Gyumri who translated Kitartel and Alves scratch to Armenian for the rest of their life, they will work for schools and in the, in their country. They, they will not say that our education system is bad. They will say that I improved it by this much, by translating our, our my master's degree. But then where is the loyalty? First? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Loyalty, is it for, for you or for the money? The money. The money. Well, I mean, who's, who's controlling? Where is, where is your... Uh, well, currently there is no. We the, well, we are not spending much. We can. It's, it's only so much we can do, right? Five thousand dollars. We can open maybe five schools on our expense. The rest is paid by others, by private sector, by government. So we're not really spending much there. Well, 
apart from our people would spend time. Um, but as I said, this will, if this gets sold in Kazakhstan, this will be a government level contract. So we will be selling it to hundreds of schools. It will be a huge revenue. We're working on that seriously with Galen Vartanian, talking to their ambassador, to their and with Dubai. So maybe this will happen. Even if with one of those, if it happens, it's already. Of course, we are not very professionally working on it, but so far focused on Armenia. But there is a business plan behind it. So from one end, you are creating your product. You will not need to... Can you, you speak louder because we can't hear your question? Oh, so from one end, you you are creating your 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 niche. At the moment, you, you're sort of, you're trying to find your niche uh, through schools and through training, through, through uh, 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 sort of... Uh, um, Okay, I, let me explain it differently. I think I understand what you're asking. So, Instigate Training Center, you've seen, right, in 10 cities, we are building, we are keeping it in order to provide people. Out of 237 currently employed people at Instigate, uh, and 80, there are 80 students also, so it's about 300. So, obviously, the students are from Instigate Training Center, but also these 230 people, 90% of them, Instigate is their first workplace. We didn't hire from other companies. So this is how Instigate is growing, how it is creating its startup. It's an incubator. It's part of its logistics to train and to teach. But we were doing it always after market. We were just taking students who graduated first class and then retraining them because they, didn't, they just lost their fight. So we now try to move this investment into the schools. It's the same money that we spend, but we're, push, we're doing like long-term investment. We're pushing this down to schools so that when they graduate, they don't have to pass this training. It's, they're doing two months full-time training and we also pay them during this training. So it's a huge amount of expense, right, in 10 training centers. So we are pushing this down into schools. It's, it's even more expense, but then it will pay off, right? It's part of our operations. How much do you pay? That means that about four students when they just to cover their transportation so that they come. So you're not paying. I mean, yeah. they're, not, they're not motivated to no, take this business on for a lifelong career to make money. No, no, when they're being trained, they are being paid like that. But when they get employed, they paid competitively. How much? It's uh, uh, roughly 100 to 150,000 rams per month when they just start after training, which is about $400 probably per month, which is for that age, for that like, how, uh, it's more than their parents are getting. How much does the doctor get? Doctors, officially, less than that. Less than that? Yeah. And, and people want to be doctors rather than electronics? Yes, because doctors get non-official money when they... <laughs> well, you're not paying them well, enough then. Probably. Well, anyway, this works for now. Actually, they get more than their teachers do, so... Hard case. Like in schools. You know, you know, I hear you right. You said you, you expect to get an influx of engineers at the rate of 5,000 a year, and you have enough uh, enough need for them for 5,000 a year. Do you, can you can this project or whatever you're planning absorb all these engineers? Yeah, it's not yeah, just us, right? Uh, it's uh, currently whichever IT company you speak to in Armenia, they all tell that they are in need and vice versa. Um, if, if you don't have so many people, you cannot start so many projects because it's just hiring, let's say, 100 people who know rough uh, basics is impossible currently. You just cannot go there and hire if you try to do it, you have to pay like three times more than in China or in India, in average. So this, these two questions are very related. So 100,000, according to current statistics, it's roughly the current average salary in Armenia. And 150 is what they started with Instigate when they get finish internship. So they get more than average salary in Armenia being just out of high school passing two, year, two months training and two months internship. So after four months, they get more than average salary, more than men, uh, their families. Their, especially in villages, they have never seen such amount of money on the table at single day. 
So because they derive food themselves, right? I mean, this is a huge amount of money for them. It's uh, it's not small. Is and uh, and, the, and but on the other hand, if you compare to India, this is still very small amount. So if you want to bring mass amount of work of low profile work like testing website, it's impossible to do it in Yerevan. You cannot hire 200 people to test websites in mass. But in Goris, you can. In, of course, if there were schools and they would. Currently, we hired 30 people in Goris. It took us nine months. So, but we could hire 200, and our customer missed them. <laughs> yes, in the back. So, I admire your, your energy and, Thank you. and uh, dedication and all that. Just frankly, the, the, the presentation was a little, you're doing a lot of things. And I happen to be pretty plugged in, and I follow what happens over there. Uh -huh. And I, I, I kind of got lost somewhere in the middle. So I have a couple of very specific questions. First, I want to understand what is the real motive of what you're doing, because I had a hard time understanding. So you're building a network of instigate sites. And you are, I, I've done all the math. Armenia produces about three to 500 quality programmers a year today. And they mostly come from two to three high schools, which are very advanced in math. And, and the state university has its own mafia and a couple of others, and everybody kind of controls where these people go. So the problem is it's a supply and demand issue. And whoever controls the supply really has, a, has an upper end on, on a lot of things. So my first question is, When these kids are going into these training schools, and you're train, you're you're not taking the training into the school. There's a difference between training and education. I mean, just like first graders need to play in the schools and, and and the streets and all that, right? When you start teaching this kind of stuff in schools, are those school or are those t uh, students when they graduate indebted to your center? If you give a kid that's never made any money 150,000 trumps, right? For him, it's a, it's a big thing. Does he need to work for you for a few years uh, in return for the training that you're giving? No, okay, there's no good case. So, so it's, it's you, you're providing free training to all these, right. all these kids. That's how Instigate started, and we have 300 people now. So who is employing these kids when they when we, they graduate? We do it in our case. But okay, this so is you only basically one part. created your workforce training program. That's, that's what you're doing. That's number one. There's a ten centers which I showed on the map. <laughs> Instigate training center. We started with that. We started taking university graduates, training them for two months to teach them because they didn't know much, really. Only twenty percent of them knows. The eighty percent just go spends their five years, learns nothing, learns not working and complaining and comes there and we teach them for two months. And then another two months internship and then we have them. That's how the get Training Center works in 10 cities currently. But the 44 schools with robotics, this is general thing. We're creating a background which helps to create... No, I love the ambition, different. right? Trust me. No, 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 I'm, 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 I'm trying to answer your question. So first is done by Instigate with 10 centers. The other is not. I'm just a member of many companies which started this robotics program in schools. It's led by Union of IT Enterprises. It's Galen Vartanian. It's not us. We just help <coughs> them to make our voice and our acts instead of LabVIEW and, Ma and Windows. So that the money that is paid by government is not going into foreign companies' pockets, but it goes into local, into open source and so on. So that's Galen Vartanian's project, Robotics Stars in School. And when we saw it, we started converting into open source, and then we saw these VEX robots, we said, no, VEX is pre-made stuff, let's children build their own with 3D printers. So we made these 3D printers. It was not our business. It had nothing to do with those 10 centers and instigate. We just said, we don't want to bring in pre-made stuff from China via USA. Basically, VEX made them in China, brings into USA, sells it to Armenia, and then Armenia's kids are constructing some toys from it. Let them build it in their labs. Let's give them 3D printers and CNC's. 
let them build it in their lab. So this was enough motivation for us to do it. You don't need more. If you have free time. So my, my second and final question. So it, it's, it's wonderful, right? And, and I totally uh, I understand the motive. Well, Armenia is a very small country that lives in a big world. Armenia has about 20,000 births a year now. So your problem is not very big, right? It used to have 80,000 births a year now. Now it has 20,000 births a year. That's the reality. Artsakh has 1,500 births a year. This is not a country. This is a neighborhood of Los Angeles. So it's a when, when, when you, well, it is a country, but it, it's, when you put it in the, in the planet, it, it's really minute. So comparing yourselves to India and China, but even though we have our flag and our own alphabet and our own version of Christianity, you're still, it's number one. Yeah, the number one. So, so my question to you is, you, you're trying to do too many things. If you were to pick, if you analyze, the problem is we don't have really good quality IT technicians in the country, right? No. How would, we don't, not enough. Not enough. Right. What, I mean, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. And the country is in poverty. Thirty-five percent of it is in poverty. What, what, what do you think? You've spent all this energy looking at all these things. What do you think, from a cause and effect perspective, is the key thing that needs to be done? Because you don't have you don't have a, a billionaire that's funding you. My sister does. You know, she founded Tumo. Uh, you don't have a billionaire that's funding you, and. Uh, you're trying to do too many things. I got the question. All these things, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, we will do what we are doing now. So basically, <laughs> instigate and global, right? Instigate, let's forget about it. I just told it because I also came to tell about Instigate, this training center, and how we started. Now, global thing, consists of intermediate schools, Mary loves to engage children into this profession. So that strong children come to, because if you don't create a demand for high schools of this program, you cannot establish a high school. You can only have champions like Ibe and Tuma, few of them, right? But we are creating a background, we are not creating champions. So your answer is robotics? I'm not trying only. to answer. So uh, basically the postulate is following. If you want your, to have Barcelona, Real Madrid and so on, every child in beach, in beaches, in villages should play football. If your country doesn't have football teams in every village, it will not have Barcelona. So we, in, order for, in order for Armenia to have these champions like Aypt or Tumo and so on and more of them, and to have champion companies which build super products, every <laughs> village should have at least small IT team, right? Robotics club. So that's what we are doing. That's background. So it's and then on top so of changing it, the culture and, and the understanding towards technology. You're saying that's the problem. Now that's you, part you, of the solution. That's part of the solution. Good. Second part is high schools. <coughs> now once demand is created, we do it all in parallel. We're not doing it one after the other. We started from university, then we decided to start from there. Decided that it doesn't work. Too, too bad. The environment is broken. So we went into middle school. So in middle school, we're choosing, we're making, we're advertising this profession. This creates demands for high schools. In high school, the same lab can help to prof build people skills who can immediately work in Instigate, for example, or any other company without going to university. This is key. Currently, in the next 10 years, our goal is to make 80% of Instigate, bottom 80% of Instigate staff doesn't have to go to university. Top 20 does. Top 2% needs to be PhD. So with these statistics, we decided to focus on bottom 80%, which means in all, high, in all villages there should be high school which is able to produce such engineers who then can choose still to go to university, to vocational training, to remote training, distance learning and so on. But without leaving their village they can immediately start working and they can still do vocation. We are working with the uh, Stepanakert University to set up a two year accelerated bachelor's class so that these parents who are sick about this diploma they get it, but with some learning behind it. We are setting up this distance learning program. We are ourselves choosing, hiring professors to teach, to record it, and then we'll fight for getting the accelerated bachelor stamp on it with government so that... But the first thing is this September in Stepanakert and Goris University we're starting the two-year vocational program, which is an option to be four years after hours. So you go to work full-time, then from home, Distance learning, you do it in four years, you get this accelerated bachelor's degree. 
Before we go on to the other questions, is uh, Albert Vartanian here? You, you want to say a few words about what you are doing and how that can help also create other new ideas? You want to come up? Yeah, I would like to introduce Albert. So we met Albert through Naira. Uh, basically, Albert and Marine are Naira's friends. They're working in, uh, in medical care. They're dentists. And uh, Albert is specialized in root canal. And it, and it turned out that uh, people in this profession has a problem with back because they are constantly bending on one side and the muscles develop on that side and they create a big problem. Like in 15 years, they have to retire. So Naira learned this and, uh, and uh, proposed them to write a proposal for engineering special equipment, which about which Albert will tell you. Yes. And Instigate Robotics hopefully will be engaged in this project. So. Well, let me correct, correct uh, Varag. I'm not an endodontist. I'm not a specialist. I'm a general dentist. And uh, I work with uh, Marine Martirosian. And we've uh, funded a um, couple of uh, university senior design project at University of Illinois to um, make dental instruments that are um, inexpensive, um, last long, and uh, can be easily manufactured and uh, serviced. So we we made a couple of prototypes, and um, our last project um, is is an optical piece. It's a small tiny microscope pretty much that fits inside a tooth and is able to wirelessly project um, the image onto a tablet computer. Um, and that's how Vahagn and our company met and now we're trying to um, <coughs> use, use the company and to uh, use their resources to come up with a mobile um, application because our product mo works with um, iPads, uh, iPhones, and we're trying to make a program that will be able to help dentists um, do root canals, do other dental procedures, um, sort of like a computer-guided um, dentistry. So that's, that's basically it. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you can see then, there's always a synergy between people who know what, what is needed and then people who know the business. So a new business is created, which is, which is what we tried to show. Yes, now, any other questions? Adrian. Could I just make a comment uh, regarding the question of the gentleman asked? At least the message I got from the presentation is that one of realizes that th there is a problem, a real problem in the education system in Armenia. Uh, not only at the university level, but even at the uh, elementary and high school level. So one of the solutions, at least that's the message I got, is to instill pride and self-respect uh, at a very young age, starting from a very young age. And this creating these robotic tools is at least one method. If there are other uh, strategies to instill this uh, self-respect and, and, and trust in the country and the future of the country, uh, you know, more power to whoever is in, uh, implementing these uh, new ideas. But this is his capability, this is his approach, and I, I think it's a uh, very respectful approach. Uh, especially then, robotics is a very important uh, technology for Armenia's future. That's one of the, the key technologies of relevance to Armenia, as far as the military is concerned, as far as agriculture is concerned, uh, as far as uh, manual labor is concerned, because we don't have a large population, and tomorrow we will need robotics to do a lot of the you know, manual labor that you know, we don't want to do. So I, I think what he's doing is extremely important for the future of Armenia, including the psychological impact that it has on the, uh, on the younger generation. Any other questions? There was a, she was before, so yes. So um, I jokingly told my friend over here, you're like the Bill Gates of Armenia. But even though that's a joke, I'd like for you to just take it and kind of feel it if you want to, be it if you want to, because I love your ambition. And um, obviously he's an old dot. 
And so I've been telling him and bragging about like, oh, they're really smart and you'll see and just come out and come to the speech. And, and I really do appreciate you. And at this moment sitting here, I feel very proud. And I'm um, thankful for the work that you're doing because it is a sector that I have been following and wanting to see if it's ever going to catch on. And I myself am in education. And here's what I do for Armenia uh, as far as education goes. Nothing. I work here in my comfort of the United States and I work with the students here and the information that I learned here in my schooling goes back into the students here. While as you know, you have many opportunities, especially with the PhD and in the science field. So I'm just thankful that you are ambitious enough to put that back into the community. Thank you. You're not doing nothing. You're teaching for children. As he, as he mentioned, uh, there is a lot of need for uh, robotics in the military. Have you worked with the Defense Department? Uh, we are trying systems? to convince, first, well, it's not, uh, it's not easy to work with military in Armenia. Military in Armenia is very much import-oriented like the rest of the Armenia. They are importing, they are buying, they are getting from Russia, mm -hmm. they are trying to use channels and so on. We're trying to convince them to re, re, um, revive the local production of uh, different defense programs. We're trying to build something like DARPA, or convince them to build DARPA, which would take the projects, or not DARPA, but some organization would, would take projects, would demilitarize them, turn into scientific research tasks, give to universities, to industry, and then get collect back assemble it into whatever they want to enter. But for that, they need to have professionals inside, right? They have to build it. So, but even to build it, they have to have professional management. There is no professional management in any organization, not in just military. I mean, Armenian government is not rich to have professional managers, right? Professional managers are working in synopsis or instigator, whatever. Not in government. They're not paid enough for that. So they need help. So we can only help them with management, with encouraging, and with forcing when <laughs> And when they don't understand, but it's not it's not easy like to go to military and do project with them. It's it's not it's not an environment where you can do it. Hopefully one day we will we'll see. But we're working on fixing the overall environment, which would enable this. Maybe not for us, or but so there are consor there is a consortium which is put up to help to regulate uh, this and to revive the economy uh, production uh, in this sphere, but. Any other questions? Yeah, early to say anything yet. Excellent. I actually did have a question. I don't know if you know of it, but I read an article about um, electronic recycling also being something that's happening in, in Armenia. Do you, do you know much about that? It was in the same paper as where I read about the arm path, so I was just wondering if there's anything you know about it. Because I have a concern about the, the no, uh, factor of the electronic recycling. 